Hi, this is Don Forsythe speaking to you about group process and in particular group power. It is certainly true that all people are created equal, but in groups inequality tends to be the rule. If you look at all the groups across the world, uh, juries for example, some individuals on those juries are more influential than others. If you look at classroom groups, teams, decision-making groups, um, some of the groups we've explored earlier in our analyses, the Impressionists for example, some of those artists were able to influence others, whereas some members of those groups had very little influence on the course of that group and its decisions. In our more recent analysis, we've talked about Milgram's experiment, where he dramatically illustrated the imbalances in power. Um, and also the example case for this particular textbook chapter is the Jonestown tragedy in which Jim Jones became extremely powerful within the group and he ex exercised dramatic amounts of power over others. Why is it that uh, groups tend to become hierarchical in their social organization? Uh, why is it that some individuals and a relatively small number of individuals can influence a larger number of group members? We'll examine this question by exploring who claims status, individual differences in seeking, seeking status, um, the factors, the psychological factors that influence who is awarded status, and we'll also talk generally about status hierarchies in groups. We'll begin our analysis by, by hearing a few words from the great anthropologist, primatologist, Franz de Waal, who will be speaking of power briefly. Power is very important for male chimpanzees, for example. They, the whole day they are busy with their power relationships. They are forming coalitions to defeat others. Uh, there's many primates for which dominance relationships are very important. And much of the time the dominance order is stable. So let's say you have a female dominance order among monkeys, which doesn't change in 10 years. And so during those 10 years you think, well, they're actually not very interested in it. But as soon as then one, let's say, a young female grows up and she becomes stronger and she starts to challenge the alpha female, then you see how much it matters to them that they, they're willing to risk their life, basically, to improve their position. I think in humans, power relationships are extremely important. And, and what happens in humans is, and I find that unfortunate, is that there's a sort of taboo on power. There was a Dutch psychologist who interviewed managers of big industries and ask them, how interested are you in power? And all the answers he got was, like, I'm interested in responsibility, I, I have leadership qualities, I want to convey that to the community, and so on. He got a lot of blah blah from these people which had nothing to do with power, but he found in his studies that they were extremely interested in power relationships. And I think in humans, there's a taboo on it. So, for example, Machiavelli is a bad word, even though Machiavelli was very open about power relationships. In chimpanzees, if I watch my chimpanzees, I, I, I am not dealing with those taboos at all. I can just talk about this male is alpha male, this male, male is beta male. He tries to get the position of the other, and I can just explain that, and people are perfectly happy with that. But as soon as you do that to humans, if you say, for example, presidential candidates are interested in power, uh, there's a lot of nervous glances that are going around, because actually these candidates don't want to be depicted as being interested in power. As Dr. Walls makes clear, it sometimes do people do resist discussing power, yet uh, power is everywhere. Uh, it's frequently conferred one person on another, but it's also frequently contested. Power is a, a fascinating social process. It always requires a relationship, interacting people. It does tend to be unevenly distributed, and it's also very dynamic in that it ebbs and flows. A person can gain power, lose power quickly. And Dr. DeWalls, of course, examines those processes in, in his particular primates, chimps for the most part, but uh, we're interested in examining those processes in, in our favorite primates, human beings. So uh, how do people achieve status in a group? How do they claim status? How do they acquire it? Oftentimes through powerful speech. Um, some people speak more uh, directly than others. Uh, and Dr. Stiles' analysis and his colleagues looking at types of speech. He classifies the various things people say into eight different categories and he finds that the more frequently people use certain types of speech, uh, they rise up in authority within the group. So uh, disclosure, questioning, advisement, interpretation, 
are all more powerful forms of speech in comparison to edification, acknowledgement, confirmation, and reflection. People also gain power and authority in groups through nonverbal displays. Uh, here we have two contrasting styles of vigilant display and an eager display. Uh, eager displays of nonverbal behavior involving the hands use, use more open gestures, more free gestures. The vigilant displays use more pointing gestures. But in addition to these kinds of uh, nonverbal hand displays, the way people sit, their postures, the way they move, the facial expressions they give, uh, their kinetics, meaning how, how they might walk about in a space and their vocalics, speaking in a loud voice, a quiet voice, a clear voice. All of those are signals that we, each one of us, picks up on and uses, in most cases only implicitly, to decide whether or not the individual we're dealing with is a powerful individual or a non-powerful person. There are individual differences in who seeks power and who does not. Some of us have a higher need for power, a basic motivational tendency to seek power than others. Um, men and women seem to differ slightly in terms of power, with men having a stronger need overall for power than women. It is linked up to biological differences. The hormone testosterone is frequently associated with the desire for power and influence. So Danius and Pratt shows a theoretical analysis of a personality tendency. Social dominance orientation is also linked to the desire for power. Uh, individuals who are high in social dominance or orientation uh, believe that existing differences among groups in terms of power and authority are relatively legitimate differences and that some groups simply are better than other groups and of course analyses of bullies and bullying suggest that bullies seek out power to a great deal compared to those who don't engage in bullying behavior in terms of, of how we achieve status uh, expectation states theory developed by joe berger cecilia ridgmond and their colleagues identifies the cognitive processes and interpersonal processes involved in conferring status on another individual. In this particular theoretical analysis, they draw a distinction between specific status cues and diffuse status cues. Specific status cues are very relevant to the group situations, the, the competencies that the, the situation requires, and individuals who display those cues, those competencies, should rise up in terms of authority in the group. However, people also take into account diffuse status characteristics. These are general social qualities that people in some cases mistakenly assume are associated with competency but have nothing to do with competency in fact. So for example, a biased individual may take into account a, another person's race um, and s say that an individual in one racial category doesn't deserve to have high status in the group whereas they may be willing to confer higher status on an, another individual simply based on race alone. Even though race is, is not a specific status char characteristic and is not reflective of overall competency. Um, status generalization as a, as a result occurs that in many cases people who have privileged, who are members of privileged categories, um, males for example, individuals with professional backgrounds, uh, white collar workers, they achieve status in groups more easily than individuals who are in less privileged social categories. Um, individuals who have solo status in the group have a very difficult time um, rising up in terms of authority structure since they're the minority in the group and they're often part of a different social category than others. Studies of online groups, although it was hoped that they would not be influenced by these diffuse status characteristics, suggest that nonetheless when individuals interact online, even though they can't see each other and even in many cases their, their cues are blocked about what their quality might be, online individuals seek out information about that and they draw inferences and then confer status just as people do in face-to-face -face groups. Um, in terms of, of why this process takes place, the social adaptation process, as, as hierarchies form, um, in, in my own research I've, in, I've, for example, placed individuals into groups and find that within Within 15 minutes, 
clear hierarchies of authority emerge. These are individuals who don't know each other prior to the group meeting, and yet through simple conversation, uh, quickly status differences emerge, uh, and they are consensual. Um, most of the members of the group agree who should be influential and who should not be influential. There's a tendency for a small group of individuals to become influential in the group. Um, Michelle's Iron Law of Oligarchy suggested that in any group, power is concentrated in the hands of the few rather than the many. This process is so natural that it's triggered, it's described nicely by interpersonal complementarity theory. This theory, which can be traced all the way back to uh, Leary's uh, early work, um, and also investigations by my colleague Stan Strong at Virginia Commonwealth University, explored the tendency for us to respond in particular ways to others' behaviors. And in particular, when people treat us in positive ways, we tend to respond in positive ways. But when people respond to us as, as dominant, uh, when they influence us, we do tend to accept that influence. It seems to trigger more submissive responses. This is Leary's classic uh, analysis of interpersonal complementarity, where he contrasts dominant behavior with submissive behavior and positive behavior, love, with hate. And in terms of the reciprocity tendency, for example, and when someone treats us assertively, we're to, we generally respond submissively in a friendly way. We act friendly ourselves. If someone acts competently, we tend to respond with respect. And also, if we respect a the person, they tend to grow in confidence. Um, if someone leads, we tend to follow. We tend to obey. So, whereas friendly behaviors trigger friendly behaviors, hostile, hostile behaviors, on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, it triggers the opposite behavior. Um, researchers have explored this process. Uh, Rane and, and Adam Galinsky and their colleagues have explored how groups function. The question is, does a group perform more effectively uh, when there is a status hierarchy within the group? And they've done research on this where they have manipulated how much influence group members have and are seeking power. And they've also done it by charting the level of testosterone of group members. And they've created such groups with varying degrees of individuals who are seeking power and individuals with varying degrees of levels of testosterone and then check to see how productive those groups are and also how the level of conflict within the groups and you can see as these charts suggest conflict is quite high when all members of the group have relatively high levels of testosterone or all are high in terms of their seeking power uh, you can also see it in terms of their productivity productivity drops when individuals are vying for power and low, low power is not necessarily a positive thing either. The best results were obtained when individuals were mixed in terms of the power that they were seeking, suggesting that perhaps uh, hierarchical groups are more adaptive ones. So long as individuals aren't challenging the hierarchy, once it becomes stable, as Dr. DeWall suggested, the group becomes very adaptive, it's able to cope, it's settled into its its behavioral rituals, and it's able to do its work well. Um, when that hierarchy is disrupted, uh, that's when the group becomes less productive. We have one final topic to discuss, the metamorphic effects of power, uh, but I'll wrap up this presentation on social status and hierarchy here with a simple statement from Dr. Milgram. Each member's acknowledgement of his place in the hierarchy stabilizes the pack. Thank you, as always, for joining me.